Ankit, welcome. We are live. Hey. Um, so, thanks for joining. I'm really excited to hear about this. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about graph neural networks lately, but uh, hearing about someone that's put them in production and is adding customer value is uh, just a super interesting topic. So, uh, looking forward to it. And uh, for those on YouTube, feel free to interrupt with any questions you can put them in the youtube chat or we also have a discord server there should be a link to it in the description so you can uh, hop on there and have a conversation um, so Ankit, before we get started with the presentation can you just give us an introduction about you and your background and and that stuff sure so thanks uh, zach for inviting me and thanks everyone for joining in. Um, so regarding me, I currently work as a senior research scientist at Uber AI. Uh, I primarily work on applied research problems, uh, particularly focused using uh, graph neural networks and its applications for entire Uber. Uh, few, few of the applications we have done, uh, obviously is one is Uber Eats recommended system, which is out in public. Other recommended, other systems, uh, other uh, things that we are looking at is around maybe fraud detection, maybe traffic prediction and other things. Uh, some work uh, from other companies also is out there. So that's my primary job uh, is what I would say. Uh, prior to that, I've been working at several startups um, and uh, particularly uh, doing machine learning kind of roles at different companies. Um, and then I received my master's from UC Berkeley and then undergrad from IIT Bombay, India. And interestingly, uh, I have a book published on TensorFlow uh, machine okay. learning. And if any any of you guys are interested, let me know. I can send you a link. Yeah, definitely uh, send that so we can put it in the description of the video. Um, so sure. what did you do in college? Was it computer science or, or what was it? Yeah, so I primarily did uh, signal processing a lot, like electronics engineering and signal processing. So that's how my background of statistics has come about. Nice. And what got you into the world of graph stuff? Was that from the uh, days of college or did that come later in your career? Oh, it definitely came later. Uh, obviously, you always read about graph stuff when you're in college, uh, but particularly applying deep learning on graphs. So that field has picked up, I would say, around 2016, 2017 timeframe uh, in academics. And uh, my general uh, part, uh, 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 one part of my job is to kind of be abreast about the latest technologies. Uh, and I saw the work from Pinterest and other companies also, and the research that is going on in graphing networks. And I thought it's a good application for uh, Uber Eats, uh, actually. And that's how we kind of started thinking about it more and more. Uh, and this project came about. And then there are other applications now that are coming about because we have executed it on one project. So can you tell me how your organization fits into the business? Is it that you're just looking for problems to solve or is it that you're serving a particular product and you try to find the solution for those problems? How does that work? Yeah, so it's always two ways. Uh, that uh, ours is a horizontal team, actually, uh, that we try to develop like uh, solutions which are generic enough, which are applicable not only, let's say, to Uber Eats, but they are applicable to other parts of the Uber also. Uh, we all we own the platforms also uh, our machine learning platforms and all those things. So think of it as a horizontal team, which does uh, engagements with uh, partner teams or product teams uh, on AI research side, and uh, which also allows platforms uh, on machine learning platforms to serve entire Uber. Now uh, sometimes the projects are come directly uh, that these are, these are an important problem for Uber to solve. Sometimes the pro pro projects are bottoms up that we think of a project which might be impactful based on the academic literature and everything else. And we try to kind of um, marry it to product and then make it a reality. And do you sit in California or, or where are you? Oh yeah, so I'm in Bay Area, okay. uh, but right now everything is work from home. Sure, sure. Cool, well, thanks for that. Um, <laughs> Feel free to go ahead and get started. I'll, I'll mute my mic and then keep an eye on the various chat rooms. And so I might interrupt you uh, with questions as we get them. Sure, thanks a lot. Um, so I think uh, I'll begin with saying that uh, this is a work, joint work with uh, several other people. Uh, uh, 
Um, and then Piero was my main collaborator. Piero Molino from Uber AI was my main collaborator in this project. Um, but there were other people involved from each team and from other teams, which kind of made this project a reality. Um, so I'll go over on what is the basic uh, graphs also uh, before directly jumping into the applications so that will give you a sense on what this thing is all about if you have never uh, dealt with this before. So I'll keep the agenda as like, uh, we'll talk about graph representation learning very briefly. Uh, I'll talk about the particular application that is uh, out in public, uh, the dish recommendation on Uber Eats. And then I'll just uh, mention how the graph learning is applied on Uber Eats directly. So let's talk about graph representation learning. Um, so graph data is everywhere, right? Uh, it is in uh, um, like social networks, obviously, biomedical networks, internet is a graph, right? And pretty much uh, anything that you can think of can be somehow represented, represented as graphs. Because of the ubiquitous nature of the graphs, uh, there are several tasks that people perform on graphs. One is node classification, so you are trying to predict a type of a given node. Another is link prediction, uh, which is you're trying to predict whether the, these two nodes in the graph are linked or not. So something like friend recommendation would be a, a kind of link prediction problem. Uh, then you have other two things that people do is like community det det detection. So one community is similar to another community in terms of nodes and graphs. And then you also have uh, network similarity that you can, so how two networks are related to each other. So, Pretty much everything maps to a learning framework. Uh, and let's think about the learning framework first, and then before we go into details on the problems itself. So essentially the idea is, and if then on the right-hand side, the figure you see, so if given this graph, you want to kind of uh, encode all the nodes in the graph to generate some set of vector embeddings. Uh, so some set of embeddings, which are like a, a, represent, a vector representation in an embedding space. The idea, however, is you can you have to define an encoder function to get to this uh, embedding representation. At the same time, uh, when you're learning that encoder function or learning the parameters of that encoder function, you want the things which are similar in graph space, whatever the notion of similarity you have defined, uh, they should be all similar in the embedding space also. So if two nodes are similar in, uh, in graph space, they should be similar in the embedding space. So the thing to think about here is like, let's say the easiest way I can define two things are similar in graph space is to, if two things are connected to each other. So that is a similarity function. And uh, the easiest way I can define if two things are similar in embedding space is like a simple cosine similarity on ZV transpose ZU. So let's say this is the simplest form that we'll also use for our purposes, but you can imagine uh, many more complex things on similarity on left-hand side and similarity on right-hand side. So I'm not going into details, but essentially the idea means that you define an encoder, you define a similarity function, and you optimize the parameters so that you obtain an encoder based on the similarity function that you're trying to optimize for. Sorry. So um, the standard uh, before graph networks, the way people used to do it most of the times is, is, is what our literature calls as a shallow encoding approaches. Right, and the shallow encoding approaches is like encoder is just an embedding lookup. Uh, so if you have already seen um, algorithms like matrix factorization, tensor factorization, uh, node to vec, deep walk, all fall into this category. What they essentially do is like you define a matrix, right, uh, in which you are trying to learn an embedding of every node in the graph. So every node in the graph is defined by one column, and the size of that column is defined by the embedding size that you learn learning for learning on so if you you can imagine that this is a very huge matrix if you have very billions of nodes of graph this matrix can become too huge to handle also sometimes but uh, the all the other all the standard algorithms of matrix factorization node to work and deep walk pretty much does do this so what is the limitation now you can understand that when you're trying to generate this kind of giant matrix right the number of parameters you're trying to learn is an each and every entry in that matrix. So number of parameters essentially are O of V, V is the number of vertices or nodes you have in the graph. And th that gets multiplied by the embeddings dimension also, which is I'm not, because it's a constant, I'm excluding it for now here. 
So again, if you have a very big graph, right, like say Facebook's graph, right, you cannot do it, number one. Number two uh, problem is that um, generally what happens with matrix factorization uh, style approaches, well, I'm saying most of the uh, uh, variants of matrix factorization, not everything. Uh, what happens is that if you have not seen a node during training, you cannot, you won't have an embedding for that, even if you see that node in the testing data. So either you retrain the entire thing again, which is not feasible for a very big graphs, uh, or you do some sort of ad hoc, uh, like adaptation, right, uh, with some running for some epochs and maybe to using stochastic gradient descent to get an embedding for a new node. The point is, sometimes it is not possible or it's very time consuming to generate embeddings for not, nodes not seen during training. Now, if you think about it, all the real world dynamic systems have a new nodes appearing all the time, right? For example, YouTube, uh, the videos get uploaded, many videos get uploaded every second, right? So if that is your graph, like a user video graph kind of thing, you won't be able to deal with major factorization in these kind of settings. So, you know, so those these kind of approaches break down when you have a scale problem. Another part is that uh, like the standard matrix factorization approaches do not encode uh, incorporate any node features. For example, uh, you can have uh, a node which is like a video of a YouTube, for example, uh, in which you can have node features which are like what is the like the metadata for video right this node or this node in the graph has its own feature set which defines that what is the type of the video who uploaded it when it was uploaded many other things so you don't take those things into account when you're trying to generate embeddings uh, for videos uh, let's say in youtube so the point is uh, that uh, there are many problems with the shallow encoding approaches uh, which prompts our way to kind of see what is a better thing out there. So let's think about um, graph networks very simply. Well, there are many variants of graph networks, okay? Uh, there is a spectral graph network, there is a spatial graph network. In this case, we are going to talk mainly about a spatial graph network because that is much easier to scale than a spectral one. Uh, or graph convolution network to be, uh, to be very precise. So the way it works is like, let's say you are given this input graph, right? And you're trying to generate an embedding for node A, okay? So what will happen is, uh, the, the idea is that uh, let's say, see the, uh, let's see the information that is there in the neighborhood of A, which is like in node B, C, and D, okay? Uh, take that information, pass it through some neural network and then get encoding of B, encoding of uh, embedding of A. And then how do we obtain uh, embedding of B? This will become more clear in the next slide also though, if you're not clear. Uh, and how do we obtain embedding of B? Let's look at its neighbors again. So B's neighbors are C and A, right? So you aggregate the information from C and A, pass it through a neural network and you get embedding of node B. And similarly in one node C, similarly for node D. Now you might imagine what is going on because you're trying to generate embedding for node A, but you're essentially using the information from node A itself. So it's like a recursive uh, loop, uh, that like self-loop, if anything. Like that. So there's no way to kind of do it. But uh, uh, there is a concept in graph networks, which, is, will, be, which will become more clear in this slide. Uh, it's known as layers, right? In neural networks, we have layers, like layer zero, layer one, layer two. Right. Similarly, in graph neural networks also, you have layers, layer zero, layer one, layer two. Uh, the thing is that the, the catch is that every node has an embedding at every layer. So node A uh, would have an embedding at layer zero, node A would also have an embedding at layer one, and node A would also have an embedding at layer two. The way it is denoted here is like uh, for a layer K embedding of a node, V is HKV. So you can see there is H1A here, uh, there is H2A here, which is layer two, and then there's layer zero. So layer zero in this case, what we have chosen is the starting feature set. So I was talking about the incorporating node features, right? So node features can be anything. Uh, node features like for our each case, the, in the dishes case, what is the dish name? What's the dish type uh, that you see on over it? So that those could be the node features directly. 
specified here. One quick um, question on this. Um, mm -hmm. did, did you use learnable embeddings as a, another set of features in the first layer as well, or did you only use actual node features? So we used um, for uh, dish names, at least in Uber Eats, we used the word to vec of dish names also um, as a starting feature so on top of like the word to vec from GenSim package. Um, on top of the existing feature set. But you didn't uh, just use randomly initialized embeddings that were learned, you know, by bootstrapping the learning process themselves so that um, you know, the actual features yeah, were yeah. appended to that? No, so we didn't do that. Uh, and I think, I don't think it makes perfect sense to do it also, to be honest, uh, because what you're on, you're not interested in layer zero embedding of a particular node. What you're essentially interested in is layer two embedding. So even if you initialize something, so it's not a usual embedding layer that you see in, let's say, TensorFlow or Keras, right? Where you uh, where the back propagation happens to that embedding uh, initialization itself, and then those numbers get updated. That is not the case. So here you get you start with some feature set, right? You aggregate the information, and then you finally reach somehow here H2A. I'll explain these parts also, but H2A is what goes into your loss function. So this has nothing to do with this. And, uh, and the update is not on this. Update is basically on the neural networks here, the backprop updates. So maybe this will become more clear, let's say. Uh, so layer zero is features of each node. So think of it like a usual feature set. Like if you're doing supervised learning, yeah, and if you're doing like logistic regression, you'll have a feature set. Think of it like a feature set for that, right? Uh, it has nothing more. Um, then finally, also you do neighborhood aggregation. So neighborhood aggregation, what it means is that if I have to kind of uh, generate some uh, uh, gen generate some understanding of what my, the B's neighbor, which are A and C, actually has, right? So I aggregate the information from layer zero of B's neighbor, right? Pass it through some aggregation function. We'll talk about aggregation functions, but think of it like a simple average for now. Right, whatever the no feature vector at xa, whatever the feature vector at xc, you just average it there or pass it through some nonlinear aggregation function. Then you have a neural network uh, which you pass that vector to, uh, and then you get the embedding of node b. Uh, there is another catch here, uh, which is like you kind of have, uh, so you you use neural network for neighborhood representation, and then but you also have neural network for self embedding. So obviously we want to capture what B's neighbor contains like A and C, right? Um, but also we want to kind of capture what B himself, like it himself or herself contains or itself contains. Um, so XB is the starting feature set for node B. You pass it through a self embedding neural network, right? And that gives you, uh, like you somehow combine these two from neighborhood and from self, and then it gives you a layer one embedding of node B, right? And what we are interested in layer two embedding of node A, uh, so, so what so these are the computer representation on layer one, let's say, right? And then layer one embedding, pass it through another aggregation function, another neural network, which is a different weights are very different than the previous layer. So W2 and W1, you can see here. And then finally you get H2A. So this is the crux of it. Like this, this design is the crux of it. Where people call this um, uh, concept of neighborhood aggregation a message passing thing, also uh, in the literature, as you might have seen. Right. So in this diagram, your uh, red boxes in the first layer, the N and B one, those are all the same parameters. Like sure. just just because yeah. there's three of them, it doesn't mean they're distinct. They're the same thing. And then the same with the blue boxes, right? But but then when you get Correct. to the second layer, it's actually a uh, a different set of weights for the blue box and the red box is layer one. Yeah. Yeah. So all the weights that you see in layer one are actually same. And that's how you okay. get around the, uh, scale like B the scalability issue that you mentioned in the beginning, right? Correct. Correct. So uh, essentially now, if you think about it, you're not learning. Your learning is not dependent on how many nodes you have in the graph. Your learning is dependent on how many neural networks, like how many neurons you have in the graph, right? And those you can limit it, like because everyone shares it, this thing. 
So same neural network parameters are shared by all the nodes, essentially, right? And that kind of gives you the scalability that you need that you don't get in the standard methods. So we have a question from the YouTube chat. It's asking, where did H1A come from? Yeah, so I have not drawn it completely, but the way, because of the space limitations, that's a good question. So the way you compute H1V, right? Similarly, you would compute H1A itself. So there might be some neural network here. There would be some neural network here, the same way. So you, whatever the neighbors of A were in the previous slide we saw, you can do exact same thing that you're doing for H1B for H1A. Yeah, so if we um, just cut, cut out um, everything, let's see, to the left of... Oh, sorry. Yeah, so if we just had H, H1A and then the blue, green, and yellow, what is it, HB1, HC1, HD1, you, you mm -hmm. can see how H2A gets calculated from that. So um, yeah. it's just, it's very hard to represent these things with diagrams, and this is actually one of the best diagrams I think I've seen on this. So uh, kudos to you there, because this is pretty okay. tricky. Yeah. Uh, so hopefully Thank that you. answers the question. Thanks, James. Okay, go sure. ahead. Okay, so as Zach mentioned also, um, so the scalability is very good in this case, but the major part is inductive capability, which we in literature calls it, right? Uh, as I was mentioning, like a YouTube video example, right? New videos are added every day, and if those are present in your graph, uh, or every second actually, if those are present in your graph, you cannot train the entire matrix factorization job again. Right? So in many real-world applications, new nodes are often added to the graph. Need to generate embeddings for nodes without, new nodes without retraining the entire thing. So hard to do with the shallow methods that I was mentioning before. So idea remains what is inductive capability. This figure illustrates it very well. So train with a snapshot, right? A new node arrives. Let's say a new video arrives on YouTube, right? Uh, and then you can generate the embedding for the new node directly because the reason you can do that is because you are not learning per node embedding. What you learned is like a uh, is like a parameters of a neural network. Think of like a simple fully connected neural network, right? Not graph network. Once you have learned the neural network weights, you can pass on any test data to it, and then it will generate the prediction of it, right? That's the idea. That's how we learn neural networks. Um, so the same idea applies here. That now what you, when you have a graph neural network trained and everything, so you have weights given a new node. Given its connections or neighbors in the graph, you can actually compute the embedding of that node. So that is very powerful uh, because now you won't have to train it again ever. Like ever, ever I mean that just for new nodes, you will definitely train for accuracy and everything else. Okay. Um, so with this just primer on graph networks, where it's applicable. So because of these reasons, we found it like a very good fit for our case on Uber Eats actually. Uh, and let me show or share what happens in Uber Eats in general. So uh, when you open Uber Eats app, there is a section known as recommended dishes section. Uh, we're going to talk about that actually. So on the left hand side, you can see a carousel, which is like a horizontal swipe. Uh, and then once so dishes are also recommended, once you go inside a restaurant, uh, and then there's something called as picked for you. Uh, although we are not going to talk about this, but the similar things apply there. We are mainly going to talk about this part uh, in this brief that we have implemented. So before going further, you need to, because we are talking about graph networks, we need to understand what is graph in Uber Eats. Like how do you represent Uber Eats as a graph in the first place, right? Um, so think of it like this, that there are several users on each, each platform, right? Uh, and uh, each uh, users uh, order from a restaurant. So each, uh, the, the user, a user is connected to a restaurant if he has already ordered from that restaurant. However, uh, users don't order restaurants, they order dishes from restaurants. So dishes are connected to restaurants because dishes belong to that restaurant. So users are also connected to restaurants because users have actually ordered, no, sorry, users are also connected to dishes because your users have already ordered those dishes before. And if you see those edges, we should have weight on the edges because you sometimes you ordered the same thing multiple times. So we need to understand what is the weight of how many times, like basically how much you like it versus you only ordered once and you didn't like it. 
So this is the graph, right? Although we didn't, uh, the thing I'm going to talk about is not using the complete graph. I'll mention what is the part of the graph we are using. But, um, but let's see how now, the, now that we have seen what is graph learning, uh, now that we have seen that how, how Uber Eats is a graph, what is how did it do graph learning in Uber Eats specifically? So let's take a simple graph for this for this uh, for the purpose of this talk. Let's say there are only two nodes, two kinds of nodes. So it's like a bipartite graph, right? Two types of nodes. There are users u1, u2, and then there are dishes d1, d2, right? And user is connected to a dish if he has ordered or she has ordered that dish in the last M days. So whatever M is like, let's say if you're going back only six months. Uh, so in the last six months, if you have ordered some dish, that would be in this graph. The weights uh, or the edge weights is basically the amount of times you have ordered in last M days. So it's like number of times you have actually ordered. And you can imagine this graph, the simple graph of two entities is definitely dynamic. We have new users get added every day. Uh, each node has features. So the one, the features that I was talking about, like you can have in um, in 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 dishes here, you can have word to work of dish names as a feature set. Uh, you can have users like whatever information we have about users, right? Uh, we can have that as an as a feature set. So you can imagine you have feature sets. You have this simple graph. Uh, now, uh, what do we do on top of it? So uh, I'm not going to details of training, but you can imagine we trained the model that we talked about. Uh, I'll mainly talk about some parts which actually made a huge impact for us was the loss function. Um, so because it's a recommendation system problem, uh, we care about ranking and not the actual similarity score. So I talked about we kind of capture the similarity by using cosine similarity. Um, sorry for the typo here, there should be transpose uh, in here. Um, in the multiplication of two vectors, um, in the dot product of two vectors. Um, but the idea is that uh, what we want to capture is like not the actual similarity, but the relative similarity to other dishes because that's all we are care about in recommendation systems. Um, so for that purpose, we use uh, max margin loss, which is kind of similar to what is used in uh, support vector machines, uh, is you have a positive pair, right? Uh, a positive pair in this case is, let's say I ordered Indian dish before, right? For me, uh, and you is me, actually, like a user is me. Uh, I ordered an Indian dish before, so uh, my similarity with Indian dish is very high, so that's a positive pair. Uh, and let's say I never ordered Italian dish, for example, right? Um, so in that case, my similarity to an Italian dish, which is ZN, should be very low, right? Um, and as long as the positive pair similarity exceeds the negative pair similarity by at least a delta margin, which should, could be very small depending on how you train it, um, my loss is zero actually, right? Uh, so I'm fine. But if the positive pair similarity doesn't exceed negative by a certain margin, then my loss is whatever it is. So correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the same loss for like trans Z. Right, it's like you, you have a yeah. positive pair, a negative pair, and you want the uh, positive pair to exceed the margin um, yeah. you, you know, further away than the negative pairs, right? That is true, that is true. Yeah, that also makes sense. However, so this is max margin loss. This is what actually helped us a lot. Um, we did something more, uh, which is specific to our application actually. Uh, and uh, let's try to understand what it means. So let's say that now there is a graph the, there, are, there are two users, U1 and U2, and there are four dishes, D1, D2, D3, D4, right? And this is the graph that you see. So let's say in this case, the positive sample I did is like U1 and D1, let's say, because U1 has ordered D1 like five times, right? Uh, there's a negative sample, U1 and D4, because U1 has not ordered D4 ever. So U1 and D4 are negative samples. However, there is one more thing you can do is, low rank positive, we call it, which is U1 and D3. So now if you think about it, U1 is definitely ordered D3, right? But it has not ordered it as much, he has not, or she has not ordered it as much as U1 and D1. So U1 and D1 um, 
is definitely should be more closer, like D1 should be more closer to D1 as compared to maybe D4 or D3, right? So we capture this by something called as having an additional term in the max margin loss, in which we say that this is the positive and negative, like the usual one that we talked about last slide. And, but we also add something else, which is like a positive and a low rank positive uh, kind of uh, um, max margin. Uh, and uh, we have a different margin for both of these things, like delta L, you would imagine should be definitely less than delta N, right? Um, and then we, these are all hyperparameters. What is delta L? What is delta N? What is alpha N? What is alpha L? Uh, so these are all the hyperparameters we play with to kind of get the uh, accuracy right in real world. I found so this, this also helps us. Yeah, I found this really interesting. And I, I just wondered if you had tried other things before you got here, like... For instance, you know, you might want to actually use the difference in the uh, the edge weight to inform, for instance, your margins, right? Like you might want uh, the fact that it's five times more than one. Somehow that makes it into the cost function. Did you play around with a bunch of things and settled on this yeah. as being the simplest and best? Or, or was this kind of the first thing you tried and it worked and you didn't really go any deeper? No, no, I think there are so obviously, it's, as always with machine learning, you try 10 different things. Uh, and then you settle on one. Um, but we did try. We did try on weighing the loss functions, like weighing the positives more, like you can weigh it here, right? Uh, like if the if this kind of comes as basically a huge loss here, right? We weigh it more, like we want don't want to classify something which has ordered misclassify, which is ordered five times uh, as compared to which is ordered one time only. So we do all sort of stuff. Like we do some Euclidean style, like uh, squaring and all those things also uh, with the different weights. Um, but what worked best for us was something like this. Thank you. Uh, another thing we did uh, in terms of, so I'm mainly talking about the few things we have done, which actually helped us a lot rather than talking about the entire thing end to end because that in the interest of time. Um, so another thing we did was weighted pool aggregation that also actually helped us. Um, so I was talking about aggregation, right? So what you're trying to do is to compute the embedding of this, this thing HD. These are the neighbors, ABC, for example. And then you're trying to message pass or propagate information to HD. So in this case, what we did was uh, we passed all the embeddings that you had for all the three nodes through a fully connected layer, which is kind of same across everywhere. And then we did uh, 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 some weighted aggregation, like basically we weighted this five times more than this one before aggregating it to HD. So that captures like uh, an influence effect of this one has more influence. Uh, this the embedding of HD should have more, should be more influenced by HA than HB and HC. So that also helped us in kind of getting uh, the good embeddings. Uh, like we can differentiate very minute things also by this embedding we saw. Yes, so um, very simplistically, uh, actually, uh, this is the offline evaluation results we got. Uh, so we used the cosine similarity that we were getting in a downstream personalized ranking model. Uh, and use graph node embeddings there, right? Uh, and the previous production model had an AUC around this. This is the final ranking model that goes to light test. Uh, and we got approximately 12% improvement in the test AUC uh, over the previous production model. So that was kind of huge for us at that time. Uh, wow. And this kind of results warranted an AB test for us. And if you see here, uh, we kind of extracted some feature importance from the downstream downstream ML model, which was like an XGBoost model. And you can see that the graph learning cosine similarity is the top feature of the model uh, compared to everything else that they have tried before. Um, so this kind of uh, gave us a confidence to see how we should do it for A-B test. Um, although I cannot quote some numbers here, uh, and this is very old slide actually now we have tried for entire US, entire world and everything else. But at that time we ran an A-B test of recommended dishes carousel, that's the carousel that you see in San Francisco. Uh, we, op we observed significant uplifted, uplift in click through rate and maybe orders also uh, with respect to the previous production model. Um, so finally, uh, it was live at that time 
uh, in San Francisco and soon everywhere else from that perspective. Yeah, and this is the data pipeline. I'll just talk briefly about it. Uh, so for people who are interested on how do we do this. Uh, <clears throat> so the way we do this is like, we have the source table, which has a hive table, you can think of like that, right? And we built a daily ingestion pipelines on, on getting daily graphs. So uh, think of it like this, we have a version nodes and edges. And uh, for every day, we kind of have uh, uh, the daily graph pipeline. Um, what we do is we extra for the current day, we collapse graph with latest nodes and edges. So we kind of obtain the graph that we need for that particular date. Uh, we, we, we also have the provision to do some past dated graphs directly. Uh, this is mainly for some offline experiments on machine learning we want to do. So once you have this uh, graph, uh, uh, once you have this graph nodes, uh, basically once you have this graph, sorry, uh, we partition the entire graph of the world by city, so because it's a city-specific model, uh, and and then uh, and then we use network X, so we convert it to network. Network X is a standard library uh, for model training and embedding uh, for, for graph representation in Python, uh, and then finally we use network X data structure or library to feed it to our TensorFlow model, which is a graph neural network model. Uh, and then we finally get node embeddings and we store that embeddings. And then finally we train a personalized Rankle model with the node embeddings uh, that I was talking about. Uh, so once you train it, you got the Rankle model. And then um, you also use the node embeddings in real time to kind of make predictions on the Rankle model. So personalized Rankle online recommendations and that's how you serve it. So do you, I guess you have a process for when you get these new nodes and edges coming in from the, the daily um, stream up on the top row, you evaluate the GNN model by getting like the two hop ego net network or whatever to uh, calculate that embedding. And then you persist that in a data store somewhere for lookup. Is that basically yeah. how it works? Okay. Yeah. 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 So basically you get the latest graph, uh, right? We partition by city because we have a city specific model. And then you train this, like basically you run through this model, right? And then you get the node embeddings and you you, you persist them in Hive, obviously. Uh, but uh, if you're using for real time for that particular day or something like that, uh, we deploy it to Cassandra uh, where we can make a long line predictions using the Ranker model. So how do you retrain the uh, model very often or is that kind of a mm -hmm. rare event? So it depends. Uh, for different cities, we have different timelines. So the way we have done it is like we do some back testing to figure out what is the right retraining time frame for different cities, right? And then we have set up the cron jobs accordingly. So the model gets retrained. Let's say every seven days for now, just hypothetically. Uh, so every seven days for every city in the world, uh, we just retrain it um, every weekly uh, because because we don't need to depend on uh, training every day because we can do inductive the inductive capability i talked about mm -hmm. that you have a new node that is come a new user comes in or a new restaurant comes in or a new dish comes in we can make predictions for that so we don't need to train every day so we are fine training every week or every two weeks or every month depending on how much loss in accuracy we get if we don't train it very frequently it's impressive you've been able to automate all, all the steps so I, I guess that means you also have a process for rolling out a new model into the real world, it, it, I guess it's with A/B testing and and will auto roll ba roll back and all that stuff. Or or how do you put those guardrails in place in these systems? Yeah, so we have internal machine learning platform, which helps us set up all those like monitoring alerts, uh, roll back, roll like deploy, uh, and all those things. So we have internal machine learning platform that helps us take care of some parts of this. Um, so that is kind of standardized across Uber. Um, so, so that helps in that setting. And you'd mentioned using other embeddings for the, um, initial features. So like word to back or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, do you ever retrain those upstream models, which then has consequences on your downstream stuff and you have to solve that engineering challenge of keeping track of all these versions, or do you just kind of use off the shelf uh, lookup embeddings? 
Yes, that's a good question. So uh, we use off the shelf uh, for at least uh, word to work. Um, but I think uh, I understand your point that for some models, it might be an issue that if you train it uh, upstream, then what happens downstream. Uh, but for our case, because word to work is pretty standard embeddings, right? Mm -hmm. um, we just directly use off the shelf. Makes sense. Thanks. Good. Yeah, so I think this is about it. Uh, if you want to find out more about it, uh, there's an overange blog post we have, right? That gives you more details about the models that we have not mentioned here. Um, and another thing we have done is like, uh, um, because we were training per city, we observed that we don't need to bootstrap every city from scratch. We can use some form of meta learning to kind of uh, transfer some information. Let's say we train the model for San Francisco. How can we utilize that information? to kind of train the model for Los Angeles. So it is not exactly transfer learning that you can think of. Uh, meta learning is a much better paradigm uh, to kind of do it. Uh, so there was, when we were doing it, there was no paper around uh, how to do meta learning on graphs. So we kind of did the in-house research and that was presented in Miriam's graph representation learning workshop last year. Uh, so you can check out that also. Um, but uh, I think, yeah. Uh, so this is the team that worked on it. Uh, so everyone was involved in some form or the other. Uh, and yes, thanks for your attention. Any questions if you have, I'm happy to answer. Yeah, perfect. Um, you didn't mention it in this talk, but I remember reading it in the blog post that you modeled the data. You, you had sort of two separate bipartite graphs. I think one was user and restaurants and one was mm -hmm. user and dishes. Uh, and then I think you mentioned in future work wanting to combine that in, into a single graph. I'm wondering mm -hmm. what challenges you had that made you make that decision of splitting them and in, instead of like, what problems did you face that made you say, I have to split these into two separate graphs? Um, I think there are two, three points. One is obviously scalability. You have to kind of... Uh, uh, look for more scalable when the when the basic solution also has been not been proven out, right? So investing more and more on scaling when you want to kind of basically test out the basic function first, whether this graph convolution networks work in real life like in production. Uh, so it made sense at that time. Uh, part of this were more organizational also, like different teams manage dishes, different teams manage restaurants, something like that, right? Uh, so you want to kind of separate out the work stream also. Um, the third part is uh, more, more of technically challenging in terms of uh, when you have many kinds of nodes and like now we have research on heterogeneous graphs a lot, mm -hmm. uh, graph networks or not. The previously heterogeneous graph networks, people were starting to explore only when we did this work. Um, so we had some ideas. We actually have tried some ideas. Now it works. But um, but at that time that we had to kind of improvise on how to incorporate many heterogeneous nodes. Uh, and learn uh, an effective uh, neural network from them. So that was more experimentation, more work. Uh, so it was kind of impeding in the velocity that we wanted to achieve and some organizational part also um, mm. that led us to kind of decide that we'll do it separately for now. But now we are in the process of combining those. And did you compare any baselines like Trans-Z? You know, I know it doesn't support node features, but did you try to tease apart what about this model is giving the tremendous lift that it's giving? Is it because it's mainly relying on the graph structure or is it um, are the attributes or, or features super important? Have you been able to tease that apart at all? Sure, yeah. So some things you have done, uh, although I've not mentioned it at many places, some things you have done is like uh, uh, try a lot of ablation studies uh, to kind of figure out where the where the um, crux lies like let's say we train it without any node features and with any node with node features we clearly see the difference right uh, the baseline for us was matrix factorization because that's what uh, each team was currently using it um, so we wanted to compare it with that baseline plus some other baseline that we also developed uh, internally um, so and then then and in the blog post we talk about a visualization actually Mm. on how um, like training for the graph networks changes the preferences of like understanding of preferences of users. Uh, so you can see more on those visualizations, which I'll not talk about here. Um, but um, the, the point was uh, that the reason this thing will work well 
is first is uh, obviously you can capture a lot more non-linearity than a matrix factorization kind of approaches, right? Uh, another thing is uh, the scalability of these approaches is very good uh, compared to a matrix factorization kind of approach and uh, an incorporation of node features, like the, the standard things I talked about, right? Uh, and those has helped us kind of decipher more on why it works. Uh, additionally, we did invest a lot on visualization and everything else, uh, which kind of helped us understand why it is working better as compared to others. So uh, one thing I'll say is that um, uh, one, one idea that helps kind of more, makes more sense here is like, <clears throat> so two pizzas from two different restaurants, right? Uh, matrix circulation will treat them very differently. Right? because there are two different IDs in my in my matrix, and those are not similar. But once you have a feature set which says that uh, word to vec uh, part is just representing pizza, so the neural network, the graph network learns that these two nodes, even if they're from different restaurants or different IDs in the graph, they're actually similar to each other in some sense. Mm -hmm. yeah, great so point. those kind of understanding uh, help the model a lot uh in terms of getting to a point where it can effectively understand what things are similar what things are not and what could be recommended so now a couple kind of high level questions uh what would you say was the biggest challenges to you and your team for kind of getting this system into a, a real-time scoring setup and into production yeah so i think um so yeah, like this is not uh, more of real time part. Let me explain this why. Because uh, what we used to do was we generate embeddings every day. Okay. Uh, and then we store it in some persistent store, right? Uh, and then deploy to Cassandra. So the online serving part was majorly on the like the ranking model I was talking about. Like let's say this is a, a logistic regression or XG boost model, right? Uh, that was served through our platform like machine learning platform internally. So serving latencies and all those things were taken care of by ranking model. And a graph model was mainly to generate embeddings, right? And I'm generating embeddings was once in a day job kind mm -hmm. of thing. We didn't do uh, every second of the day, particularly because our use case is not same as like a YouTube or something where the videos get uploaded every second, right? For right. us, a user joins maybe once a day or a restaurant gets onboarded once a day. So because of that, we could have actually moved, we actually moved to um, batch processing for this one in terms of generating embeddings. But we have other applications right now where there is a need of uh, generating online. Um, so I'll not talk about those because those are not public yet. Um, but in this particular case, it was more of batch processing. So if that wasn't your challenge of having to figure that out, what, what were the big challenges, if any? Yeah, oh, there are always definitely challenges. Um, so when you're trying, uh, I think uh, some part comes with the organizational challenges also, um, and there are definitely technical challenges. Uh, technical challenges were, uh, we, this was the first time any graph convolution networks were being used at Uber. Uh, uh, people didn't have much understanding on how to do it, what to do it, uh, and how it can potentially scale. So we encountered a lot in terms of graph generation of failure cases a lot. Right. In terms of graph uh, storage, uh, we encountered a lot of issues on that front, uh, and then uh, and then and then uh, training for globally. Right, uh, we want we, even if we have a per city model, coordinating all the jobs for like 300 plus cities or 500 plus cities across the world uh, had to like a lot of checks had to be put in place, a lot of monitoring, a lot of alerts. Um, so I think those like. The, the 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 usual uh, scaling part of a machine learning models definitely have a challenge and particularly with these kind of models which are not been deployed any time anywhere inside uber uh, you have to deal with uh, healthy skepticism also uh, from different parts of the company so i think there was some organizational challenge and uh, some part on technical challenge like mm -hmm. this and my last question was if you had to or if you got to uh, redesign this from scratch today, is there something you would do differently about the way it's implemented or architected or maybe even modeled? Or uh, are you pretty happy with everything you did? Yeah, so this was definitely a good start, but now that I know that this kind of thing works, 
right? I would directly start with a heterogeneous approach. Like if I was starting today, I know there is a lot of research behind it. And, uh, and additionally, when I started doing it, there were no libraries. Like today we see deep graph library and PyTorch geometric, which are very popular in uh, graph mm -hmm. networks area. And when I started, there was no library actually. So my code for this application is basically, I've written it from a bare bones part uh, on from TensorFlow 1.0. So, um, so the, if I were to start it again, I would definitely use the existing libraries. Uh, I would directly go ahead with the heterogeneous graph rather than uh, limiting myself to just two entities graph. Like, more, like I can incorporate more entities in the food graph. Uh, so that would be the like the perfect way to go about it now. Hmm. Yeah, and I, I would ask you what's next for your team, but I'm sure that's uh, not something you can really talk about. So. We won't go there, yeah. uh, but th this is really fascinating. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I don't see any other questions in the chat right now. Sure. Um, so c can you give me a, a quick spiel about your book? What's it called? What's it cover? I know you said TensorFlow, but uh, can you give yeah. a little bit more detail? Yeah. So uh, my book is on uh, TensorFlow machine learning projects. Uh, so this book covers basically a 13, 13 machine learning projects. Uh, real-world machine learning projects at different areas. So it covers from reinforcement learning to GANs, um, like Disco GANs, uh, Gaussian processes, uh, Bayesian neural networks, uh, and the different kind of data sets also, image, text, uh, um, and then normal uh, time series data set. So the idea is that uh, each chapter, it builds, helps you build uh, a project from scratch on in TensorFlow. So it explains the concepts of TensorFlow. It explains the theory behind machine learning for that particular chapter, uh, explains the data, and helps you build step by step the project itself, which you can use it actually somewhere. Uh, but I, I, I got, uh, I particularly wrote this book because I had my own issues when I was learning TensorFlow that I was not able to, uh, like I, I, there were good tutorials online, like Google had definitely had good tutorials, but I was not able to build the projects end to end. Uh, which was, uh, or I didn't get a book where I was able to see many real world projects. Uh, so I think I wrote this book for the, with the idea that people who are starting out and want to kind of learn by doing, uh, this is a perfect book for them. So it's known as TensorFlow Machine Learning Projects. You can find it on Amazon um, and you can uh, add my name to it, Ankit Jen, and then definitely you'll get it on Amazon. Yeah, send me a link. Uh, I'll be sure to put it in the description. Sure. So what, what was your experience like writing it? How, how long did it take you? Uh, yeah, writing a book is always a tough job. Now I realized it. Uh, when I started it, I was I didn't realize it. Uh, so it took me more than a year, actually, to finish up, finish this. Um, the experience is obviously, uh, it uh, is uh, exciting. Uh, and definitely, it is very taxing on your time with the job. Uh, so pretty much my entire weekends for one year were just spent writing the book. Wow. Um, so, so, so yeah, it, it takes a hit on your family life, but uh, I think it's, and then, and then, uh, it's worth it if people uh, read it and say it's good enough for them. That's great. Well, thanks again for your time. I'll, uh, wrap up the, uh, stream and then stick around. I had a couple other things to chat about, but, uh, sure. again, thanks again. And if you ever have something else you guys are working on, either an Uber or whatever other context please uh, feel free to come back on and tell us about it. Definitely. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone.